Chapter 1, A Call to Action A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, the Galactic Republic had reigned over the galaxy for over 25,000 years, bringing prosperity, wealth, and security to its vast expanse. Yet despite its age, the Republic had never managed to establish a centralized and efficient administrative system. Its bureaucracy, oligarchy, and loosely organized political structure rendered it a magnificent yet incredibly fragile entity. More akin to a confederation of sovereign planets than a single nation, the Republic's splendor masked countless underlying tensions. The galaxy, divided into the core, inner, middle, and outer rim territories, saw its outer edges plagued by poverty and backwardness. Yet these regions were populous. The stark contrast between the affluent inner regions and the impoverished outer rim sowed the seeds of discord, breeding separatist movements that threatened the Republic's unity. Amidst this brewing storm, a mysterious spaceship descended upon the model sector at the galaxy's edge, marking the arrival of an unknown variable in the impending chaos. You must make a choice, Tang Xiao. The galaxy is in turmoil, innocent lives are lost daily, fate now presents you with an opportunity. Will you embrace it or turn away? A deep, enigmatic voice echoed in Tang Xiao's mind. He found himself suspended in the vastness of space, gazing down upon the myriad stars below. Am I dreaming? Embrace what? He wondered, looking at his hands that seemed both ethereal and tangible. Suddenly, a colossal warship soared above him, its immense size taking a moment to fully pass by. Its cold cannons adjusted aim and unleashed a beam of energy, dwarfing him in comparison. Without warning, another fleet appeared, engaging in a fierce battle with the first. The sky was ablaze with laser fire, tearing through the silence of space. Fighter ships darted around the larger vessels, weaving a dance of death punctuated by flashes of explosions. In the silence of space, the spectacle was eerily quiet yet undeniably brutal. The warship overhead was struck, its armor ripped open as flames spread. Tang Xiao could see crew members ejected into the vacuum, desperately struggling in the cold void. This is. His gaze shifted to the distant fleet recognizing the triangular hulls and towering bridges of the ships, surrounded by H-shaped fighters. His memory clicked, and he gasped. TIE Fighters! Imperial-class Star Destroyers! This is the battlefield of Star Wars! As quickly as it had formed, the scene shattered, dissolving like glass, and Tang Xiao found himself back in the serene expanse of space. Yet, looking down, he could see wars ravaging planet after planet, a galaxy crying out for a hero. In that moment, Tang Xiao understood the weight of the choice before him. The voice was offering him a chance to step into a story much larger than himself, to leave a mark on a galaxy torn by conflict. The question now was, would he accept the call to action? Amidst the apocalyptic backdrop of nuclear explosions and mushroom clouds, a low, mysterious voice promised rewards for choices yet to be made. Tang Xiao, caught in the midst of this chaos, found himself being pulled by an unseen force, spinning uncontrollably. It was an unsettling sensation, akin to being flushed down a toilet. His protests and pleas to return were cut short as he was transported across the cosmos. Upon arrival in an unknown galaxy, the onboard AI initiated a scan of a planet within. The planet, though habitable with an A2-level breathable atmosphere and a diverse terrain of forests, mountains, savannas, and plains, was deemed too small for the needs of social development, earning a B-plus overall assessment. With the hyperspace core malfunctioning and unable to proceed with further transitions, the AI decided to commence the interstellar colonization process, as per the Interstellar Colonization Act. Tang Xiao awoke from his induced hibernation to a world of knowledge forcibly crammed into his brain, covering management, tea, psychology, sociology, agriculture, and industry. The discomfort of this rapid learning process was palpable as he found himself in a sterile white room, lying in a glass pod that, despite its narrowness, offered comfort. The room was bathed in a soft, omnipresent light, eliminating shadows and giving it an ethereal quality. Robotic arms busied themselves with various instruments, and green plants added a touch of life to the otherwise clinical environment. Confused and disoriented, Tang Xiao questioned his surroundings and the voice addressing him. The AI introduced itself as the core control computer of the mothership, explaining that Tang Xiao was in the medical room for administrators on the living area of the mothership. 
It urged him to proceed to the bridge when ready and informed him that nutritional supplements were available upon request. The concept of a mothership equipped with a hyperspace core for interstellar colonization was foreign to Tang Xiao. The AI elaborated that the origin civilization's information had been lost, and now the mothership, along with its 600,000 hibernating residents and 50,000 crew members, was under his command. These individuals had been meticulously selected and trained in various specialties to support the colonization effort. Additionally, the mothership housed a giant embryo bank, further emphasizing the scale and ambition of this interstellar journey. Tang Xiao, now designated as the manager of this colossal endeavor, was tasked with deciding whether to initiate the colonization process on this new world. The responsibility was immense, and the path ahead uncertain, but the promise of forging a new civilization in the stars was an opportunity unlike any other. Tang Xiao's mind was in turmoil. He had experienced a bizarre dream in which a mysterious voice prompted him to make a choice, only to awaken and discover he had assumed control of a colossal mothership. This vessel, capable of accommodating 600,000 individuals, was beyond his comprehension in size and scope. As he struggled to his feet, Tang Xiao approached the mirror beside the sink. Reflected back at him was a young man with a sunny disposition, albeit slightly pale. His appearance was familiar, yet it seemed as though it had been meticulously groomed. His skin was smoother, his hair and eyebrows neatly trimmed, giving him a refreshed look. He was clad in a white uniform adorned with gold inlays on the lapels, crafted from a material so light and supple it felt almost weightless. The realization hit him like a thunderbolt. Had he transmigrated? Memories of his previous life, his family, and friends all seemed to vanish into thin air, leaving him isolated in this unfamiliar world. The shock of this revelation caused Tang Xiao to stagger, barely able to maintain his balance. He attempted to splash his face with cold water to regain his senses, but the water that flowed was comfortably warm. Frustrated by his inability to adjust the temperature and overwhelmed by a surge of anger and helplessness, Tang Xiao lashed out, shattering the mirror with his fist. The resulting pain and sight of his bloodied hand momentarily intensified his distress. The medical cabin door swung open, and two young, attractive female nurses rushed to his aid. One supported him, while the other swiftly began to treat his wounds. The manager may be experiencing adverse effects from hibernation. We need to administer antiminfine, one nurse declared. Within seconds, a robotic arm prepared an injection and handed it to her. Please, manager, calm down. This medication will help soothe your mind. You just need to sleep for no more than two hours in a normal state, the nurse implored, holding his face with earnest concern. Tang Xiao, still in a state of agitation, pushed the nurse away and shouted, Get that syringe away from me. All of you, get out! But, manager, one nurse began. Leave! Tang Xiao roared, and the nurses hastily exited the cabin, though their silhouettes lingered at the door, indicating their reluctance to stray too far. Taking a deep breath, Tang Xiao returned to the sink. Adjust the water temperature to cold. You can do that, right? A computer. I am the core control computer of the mothership. You may refer to me as the main brain. The water temperature has been adjusted. Please, use it at your leisure. The cold water splashed over Tang Xiao's face, helping him to regain clarity. He began piecing together the events, suspecting a link between his dream and his current predicament. The mysterious voice had offered him a choice, and though it was unclear whether he had actually made a decision, the voice had promised a reward for his selection. Could this mothership be that reward? Then, what was the purpose of his selection? Tang Xiao recalled the cosmic battlefield from his dream, filled with spaceships and battleships reminiscent of Star Wars. If he truly had been transported to the Star Wars universe, where disagreements could lead to stellar explosions, this mothership would hardly stand a chance. Even commanding a titan from Eve would be insufficient. Tang Xiao sat alone in the medical cabin, pondering his situation for a long time. The master's assistant began to press him for action. Manager, due to the current scarcity of supplies on the mothership, if your health has recovered, please proceed to the bridge to oversee operations. Should you still be experiencing any health issues, I can summon the onboard medical staff for you. 
No, there's no need for that. Let's head to the bridge now, Tang Xiao replied as he stood up decisively. Chapter 2 Anomalies on the Mothership The cabin door slid open, and the green indicator lights along the pristine white corridor flickered to life, guiding Tang Xiao toward the elevator, leading to the bridge. The nurse stationed at the door quickly lowered her head in acknowledgement before scurrying back to the medical bay to continue her duties. The manager has awakened. Please ensure all staff in each department are aware of their work assignments, echoed the mainframe's announcement through the corridor. Despite the repeated broadcasts, the vast space remained eerily deserted. Tang Xiao's journey through the corridor felt longer due to the absence of personnel, until finally he encountered two soldiers clad in black uniforms stationed by the elevator. Upon noticing Tang Xiao, they snapped to attention, delivering a crisp military salute. Hello, manager, they greeted. Feeling slightly out of his element, Tang Xiao managed a nod in response, which seemed to bolster the soldiers' pride, their stances growing even more erect. The elevator ride to the bridge took approximately ten minutes. To Tang Xiao's relief, the elevator was equipped with a television and a terminal for work, offering some distraction from the uncertainty of his current situation. However, Tang Xiao found himself at a loss, unsure of how to proceed. Upon arriving, he stepped into a vast hall, greeted by the sight of two more soldiers who saluted him promptly. The hall was dominated by a massive holographic projection of a star map, though vast sections of it were shrouded in darkness, revealing nothing. Surrounding the projection were numerous seats and consoles, indicating that the operation of this space required the collaboration of hundreds, yet only a dozen individuals were present. Hello, manager. The workers in the hall rose and saluted in unison as Tang Xiao entered. Acknowledging them, Tang Xiao's gaze was drawn to the enormous panoramic observation window. Beyond it, a verdant planet caught his eye. Unlike Earth's familiar blues, this planet was engulfed in greenery, its surface a tapestry of lush vegetation. White clouds adorned its atmosphere, hinting at a hospitable environment. Yet, it was not this green planet that captured Tang Xiao's attention, but the colossal gas giant looming behind it. The smaller planet seemed minuscule in comparison, like a mouse beside an elephant. The gas giant's pale blue hue was marred only by dark, swirling cyclones, reminiscent of a child's plaything. Is this the habitable planet we've discovered? Tang Xiao inquired. Yes, manager, responded the holographic projection, which then shifted to display a binary star system. The system consists of two stars orbiting a common center. Within it lies a gas giant with a diameter of 48,951 kilometers. Additionally, this gas giant is orbited by nine moons, one of which we are currently near. Another moon presents a suitable climate for colonization, though its surface is over 99% water, making it impractical for our purposes. Nine satellites orbiting a gas giant? Tang Xiao mused, trying to recall any relevant information. So, our only option for colonization is this moon. What steps should we take next? Can anyone offer guidance? A young man, around 25 or 26 years old, dressed in a dark blue military uniform, stood from a round table. He saluted Tang Xiao and said, Our immediate priority is to secure fuel. The atmosphere of the gas giant is rich in helium, an essential resource for our ship's reactors. We must construct a mining station near the gas giant. The mothership's warehouse contains modular components for this purpose, and we have small engineering ships in the hangar ready for assembly. However, we need pilots to operate these ships. Do I need to awaken these pilots? Tang Xiao asked. Yes. After your emergence from hibernation, the mainframe has already initiated the awakening of 50 personnel, including potential pilots, to support our mission. Tang Xiao nodded in approval upon hearing the detailed briefing. Impressive organization. What's your name? He inquired, noting the speaker's meticulous manner. My name is Qi Jian, sir. I'm a member of the staff, Qi Jian responded, standing tall with pride. Qi Jian, a strong name. Well, if we don't have a designated chief of staff, you'll assume the role temporarily, Tang Xiao decided. Qi Jian's excitement was palpable. Yes, sir, we will fulfill our duties. Excellent. Now, show me the status of our crew in hibernation, Tang Xiao commanded, settling into the central seat of the bridge. At his command, a vast holographic screen materialized before him, 
displaying the names of 600,000 residents and 50,000 crew members, each skilled in various fields. Given the circumstances, Tang Xiao recognized the necessity of selecting from the 50,000 crew members who were more acquainted with the operations aboard the mothership. The crew was categorized into ordinary, elite, and master levels, with an additional three levels shrouded in mystery. The criteria for awakening these individuals varied significantly. Master level talents, for instance, were experts at the zenith of their fields, demanding conditions that seemed almost ludicrous for a nascent colony lacking basic amenities. Driven by curiosity, Tang Xiao explored the demands of a master level astrophysicist, which included a three story villa, a private swimming pool, a state of the art laboratory, and a super radio observatory situated on a plateau at least 3,000 meters above sea level. Another master, this time in quantum mechanics, required a dust-free laboratory, cutting-edge experimental apparatus, a particle collider spanning at least 50 kilometers, and peculiarly, two beautiful women over the age of 20 as personal secretaries, along with a velvet bed no smaller than 5 meters in diameter. Tang Xiao couldn't help but exclaim at the absurdity of these demands. Even the seemingly modest request from a master sociologist who only asked for a colony population exceeding 10 million seemed outrageous under the circumstances. Deciding that awakening these master-level individuals was impractical, Tang Xiao refrained from exploring the elite level. Without the means to meet their extravagant demands, he anticipated that their awakening would only lead to dissatisfaction or worse. Turning his attention to the ordinary crew members, Tang Xiao found their requirements far more reasonable. Most simply sought basic necessities like food, shelter, and employment. A few had minor preferences, such as working alongside members of the opposite sex or having access to noodles. Before proceeding with the awakening process, Tang Xiao paused to clarify. Master, am I the only one authorized to awaken the crew? And will they all be working under my command? Yes, you possess the highest authority aboard the mothership. Your commands, including the potential self-destruction of the mothership, will be executed without question. All crew members and inhabitants have been selected by you and are utterly loyal, the master confirmed. With this assurance, Tang Xiao felt the weight of his responsibility. He was determined to make judicious decisions in awakening the crew, prioritizing the immediate needs of their fledgling colony. When did I make this choice? Tang Xiao mused silently, his thoughts interrupted by the lack of relevant records in the database. With a nod of determination, he quickly located the engineering department among the ordinary crew members. He decided to awaken 10 teams, each comprising 10 individuals tasked with operating an engineering spaceship. Following the Master Brain's advice, he also roused two teams of ten for logistical maintenance duties. Tang Xiao adapted swiftly to his role, finding the small-scale task delegation relatively straightforward. Additionally, he awakened twenty individuals from the Ministry of Agriculture to attend to the hydroponics cabins aboard the mothership. Upon inspection, he discovered that many crops within the hydroponic cabins had perished, this explained the master's warning about the dwindling supplies. With the most critical tasks addressed, Tang Xiao allowed himself a moment of relaxation, casually crossing his legs as he requested, Master, please provide an overview of this mothership's basic specifications. Understood, the master brain responded. The room's center was soon illuminated by a holographic projection displaying the mothership in its entirety. The master brain then proceeded with a detailed explanation. The origins and manufacturers of this ship are unknown. The current highest authority and administrator is Tang Xiao. Technical specifications include a total height of 41.37 kilometers, a maximum length of 10.92 kilometers, and a total mass of 373.079 billion tons. The armament comprises five mass projectors and a point defense system with 377 small electromagnetic rapid-fire guns. Total capacity. As the master brain continued with its meticulous briefing, Tang Xiao's attention was captivated not by the technical details, but by the holographic projection of the colossal spaceship before him. Resembling a crescent moon or a banana, the ship's design was aesthetically pleasing, featuring a notable gap at its upper middle where numerous portholes and the bridge were located. 
However, what truly astonished Tang Xiao was not merely the ship's gargantuan size, which spanned a distance comparable to that from the imperial capital to Langfang, but its familiarity. Home planet, the Kushan mothership, Tang Xiao exclaimed, leaping from his seat in disbelief. He recognized the ship from Home Planet, Song of Kushan, a groundbreaking game that had revolutionized the space real-time strategy genre. The game, renowned for its expansive narrative, had captivated a young Tang Xiao, leaving a lasting impression. Yet, the realization that he now commanded the iconic Kushan mothership from the home planet universe was bewildering. How had a fictional vessel from a video game materialized into reality? Moreover, if the Kushan mothership's existence was tangible, did that imply the possibility of his dream being a reality? Was he truly ensconced within the Star Wars universe? Chapter 3. An Astonishing Database? Mom, I really want to go home. If this were Star Wars, not even the formidable Star Destroyer could offer resistance. Tang Xiao covered his forehead. The initial excitement from discovering the reality of the Kushan mothership in the game dissipating. He took a moment to compose himself before turning to his chief of staff, Qi Jian. Qi Jian, can you give me an overview of our defense capabilities? Qi Jian, stepping confidently into his role, promptly responded, We have five aerotype reconnaissance aircraft and five blade-type light fighters at our disposal. Tang Xiao maintained a polite smile, which was followed by an awkward silence. After more than ten seconds, he encouraged Qi Jian to continue. Go on, I'm listening. That's all we have. Qi Jian admitted. Tang Xiao, already feeling a sense of dread, leaped up in disbelief and exclaimed, You're telling me a mothership carrying 650,000 people is protected by only five reconnaissance planes and five fighter jets? Qi Jian, taken aback by the sudden outburst, apologized. I'm sorry, manager. The logbook has vanished, leaving us in the dark about what transpired during the past voyage. Unfortunately, these small ships are all we have for our protection. Let's see the data on these so-called protectors. They must at least match the performance of an infinite destiny Gundam, right? Tang Xiao said, settling back into his seat. The holographic projection displayed a simple, unattractive triangular spaceship. This is an aerotype reconnaissance plane, 9.5 meters in length, lacking both hyperspace jumping ability and intra-atmospheric combat capability. Its maximum cruising speed is 1,000 meters per second, and it's equipped with two primary electromagnetic cannons. Due to space constraints for the afterburner, the cannons are positioned on the left side of the hull, resulting in limited ammunition, the main brain explained. Then the projection shifted to a slightly more robust spaceship with a rectangular hull. This is a blade-type light fighter, 7.4 meters in length, also without hyperspace jump capability and intra-atmospheric combat capability. Its maximum cruising speed is 857 meters per second, and it features two six-barreled electromagnetic cannons, the main brain continued. Tang Xiao collapsed to the ground in despair. Manager, are you all right? Qi Jian rushed over, hesitant to offer a hand. After a moment, Tang Xiao stood up, clearing his throat. So, aside from these two inadequate ships, we're essentially defenseless, correct? It's not all bad, manager. Our database contains comprehensive data on a wide array of ships. Qi Jian tried to reassure him, a hint of pride in his voice. Remember, the legacy of the ship grants us the privilege to board this unparalleled mothership. Master, what exactly is in our database? Tang Xiao inquired, turning around. The database includes data on numerous spacecraft, including a giant mothership exceeding 74,000 meters in length. However, possessing the data alone is insufficient. Transforming these data into tangible ships requires extensive scientific research and a significant investment of time and resources, the main brain clarified. Tang Xiao's interest was piqued. Show me what other spaceships we have. The data and entries immediately appeared before him, overwhelming him with their scope. The database contained not only spaceships, but also comprehensive data on various aspects of people's livelihood, society, culture, and science and technology. This piqued his curiosity further. He didn't recall the game Homeland featuring such an extensive array of spaceships. Even considering all the Homeland series combined, there weren't more than a hundred items in total. So where did all these projects come from? 
As countless stars twinkled in the vast expanse of space, Tang Xiao found himself in awe. However, his astonishment only grew as he encountered some familiar silhouettes passing by. A Raven-class battleship, Tauren-class battlecruisers, Cole-class bat, Lee cruisers, an Orion-class assault carrier, and an Endless-class supercarrier. Recognizing these names and their distinctive designs, Tang Xiao's jaw dropped in disbelief. What's going on? This incredible database, does it contain all the data from space science fiction games? He wondered aloud. To be precise, the author played an endless dollar system error, repaired, the main brain interjected, its voice cutting through the silence before adding, these data were already present in the database. No additional information is available. Hold on. You're not saying that the one over 74,000 meters in length, could it be? Tang Xiao's mind raced as he quickly browsed through the list. His eyes widened as an opulent golden battleship materialized before him. Yeah, the Spear of Adun? Is it really the Spear of Adun, the Protoss mothership from StarCraft? Yes, this mothership is named the Spear of Adun, measuring a total length of 74,550 meters, the main brain confirmed. Then let's build it. With the Spear of Adun, our safety will be guaranteed. Tang Xiao exclaimed, unable to contain his excitement. Currently, constructing the Spear of Adun is not feasible. Even if we had the necessary workers and resources, the vast difference in production processes means we cannot even begin to construct a small part of the Spear of Adun. Construction can only commence once our scientific research department has managed to decipher and understand the data concerning the Spear of Adun, the main brain explained. Tang Xiao sighed, a wry smile on his face as he acknowledged the inevitable. Ah, I understand. The technology of the Protoss is completely different from ours. It's impossible for us to build something like that. Manager, what is a star spirit? Chi Jian inquired, puzzled. It's nothing. Let's focus on the projects that are realistic for us and see what spaceships we can actually build. Tang Xiao replied dismissing the question. The production line on the mothership can currently produce two types of fighters, the aero-type reconnaissance plane and the blade-type light fighter. There is also a small transport ship available for transporting goods between the planet and the mothership. To construct larger spaceships, a space dock will be required. Additionally, there are some technologies with production processes similar to ours. The scientific research department should be able to complete their analysis shortly. Would you like me to list them? The main brain offered. Forget it. We currently lack the space and resources to dedicate to scientific research, Tang Xiao decided, turning his attention back to the task at hand. He addressed the civilian staff. Have the materials on the mothership been organized? They have been organized. As the core computer mentioned, our material inventory is significantly below the critical level. The Ministry of Agriculture reported that most of the crops in the hydroponic cabin have withered, a female clerk reported, concern evident in her voice. Therefore, the best course of action would be to initiate landing procedures as soon as possible. We should be able to find food on the planet. Chi Jian, proceed with the production of five more aero reconnaissance planes and 20 blade fighters. Awaken 20 aircraft pilots to ensure the basic safety of the mothership. Then, dispatch a transport plane to scout Dawnstar and identify a suitable landing site. Additionally, awaken an extra 50 marines to be on standby at all times, Tang Xiao ordered. Yes. Chi Jian responded promptly, saluting before hurrying off to execute the orders. One more thing, Tang Xiao added, pausing to gather his thoughts. This marks the beginning of our journey in this unfamiliar universe. From this moment forward, we shall name this habitable planet Dawn Planet. It will be our new home. Yes, Dawn Planet. This will be our new home. Chi Jian responded enthusiastically, saluting once more. The rest of the crew on the bridge stood up and saluted in unison, then broke into applause, sharing their bap excitement with one another. Watching the jubilant crowd, Tang Xiao sighed. Despite the challenges ahead, the lack of joy in his expression was replaced by a sense of determination and hope for their future on Dawn Planet. Tang Xiao slumped back into his seat, his expression vacant as if he had become a zombie. Memories of his past life flooded his mind, his family, his father, mother, and girlfriend. The initial shock of his current situation had worn off, 
leaving him with a deep sense of melancholy. Despite being in the bustling command center of the mothership, he felt an overwhelming sense of isolation. Given the choice, he would gladly forsake the mothership, the advanced databases, and even the Spear of Adun. All he yearned for was to return to the 21st century Earth he called home. He wished that all these elements were merely data on a computer's hard drive, not realities he had to confront and battle against. He longed for the simplicity and safety of his home, where life's biggest concerns didn't include the fear of a star destroyer appearing out of nowhere to abduct him. Ignoring the activity in the command center, Tang Xiao silently made his way to the luxurious quarters assigned to him. He collapsed onto the soft, velvet bed, unable to hold back his tears. As sleep overtook him, he harbored a faint hope that upon waking, he would discover that everything he had experienced was nothing more than a dream. Chapter 4 Breakthrough in the Universe A burst of soothing music gently roused Tang Xiao from his slumber. He blinked open his eyes, taking in his surroundings with a resigned smile. Manager, I apologize for the intrusion, but there are urgent matters requiring your decision, came Qijian's voice from the communicator beside him. Whatever it is, it can wait, Tang Xiao declared as he rose from his bed and made his way to the bathroom. He requested the system to adjust the water temperature to an ice-cold level before splashing his face vigorously. Gripping the edges of the wash basin, he stared at his reflection, noting how the cold had drained the color from his face. Gritting his teeth, he eventually straightened up, dressed swiftly, and stormed out of the room. Master, lead the way to the bridge. Upon arriving at the bridge command center, Qi Jian greeted Tang Xiao with a respectful salute. Manager, I'm sorry for the disturbance. Proceed, Tang Xiao responded, his tone indifferent. The engineering team has successfully established two mining stations near the gaseous planet. We've already sent back and refined two shipments of helium-3 while you were resting. This allows us to dispatch more ships, particularly a transport vessel, for continuous trips between the Dawn Planet and the mothership, Qi Jian reported. Continue, Tang Xiao urged. The reconnaissance team has also returned with a report, identifying 17 potential landing sites. We can select one for our initial landing, Qi Jian added, his voice trembling slightly as he presented the interface to Tang Xiao. Do as you see fit, Tang Xiao dismissed with a wave of his hand. Qi Jian appeared taken aback. Administrator, this first colony could potentially become our capital in the future. I, I wouldn't dare make such a significant decision on your behalf. Tang Xiao, initially irritable, took another look at the screen. He was about to make a random selection when he caught Qi Jian's earnest gaze, filled with a mix of hope, pride, and slight anxiety. Qi Jian's fists were clenched, his body trembling slightly as he struggled to contain his excitement. It wasn't just him. The entire bridge crew seemed to share these sentiments. With a sigh, Tang Xiao gave the screen his full attention. The knowledge that had been forcefully crammed into his mind now surged forth, aiding him in making an informed decision. He selected a region characterized by mountains, rivers, and vast grasslands. Pointing to the chosen site, he instructed Qi Jian, Here, the latitude is moderate, with nearby water sources. There's also a hill over 1,000 meters high that can serve as a strategic defensive position. Dispatch 20 Marines to secure the area and commence construction of the residential zone as soon as the perimeter is secured. Yes, manager, this will be our first colony, our initial step into the universe. Qi Jian, visibly excited, immediately set the plans into motion. Once the landing site was confirmed, operations on all fronts kicked into high gear. A transport ship, carrying 20 marines and 50 construction workers, soon departed from the mothership and made its descent onto the planet Dawn. The marines quickly spread out, driving away wild animals and installing locator beacons, while the construction workers began assembling their mechanized exoskeletons for the build. The beacon signal is stable, manager. The mothership can now enter synchronous orbit, Qi Jian reported after confirming the beacon signal. Tang Xiao nodded, instructing the bridge operator, enter the synchronous orbit of the Dawn planet and maintain the mothership's position above the beacon at all times. Master, assist with this operation. Understood, came the reply. The engines of the cushion mothership 
a colossal structure over 41,300 meters tall, roared to life once more. Its immense power propelled the 370 billion ton behemoth forward, gradually descending into the dawn planet's outer gravitational field before aligning with the planet's rotational speed as it approached orbit. On the planet dawn, the arrival of the mothership with its immense mass triggered several earthquakes ranging from magnitude 3 to 5, as well as eruptions of groundwater on the planet's surface. Once it entered its predetermined orbit, the mothership utilized the centrifugal force and inertia from the planet's rotation, requiring minimal power to maintain its course. In synchronization with the ground beacon, a hatch at the center of the mothership opened, launching an orbital drop pod. As it descended through the atmosphere, friction caused the pod to ignite the air around it, making it appear as a meteor to those on the ground. Just before landing, the pod's reverse engines activated, emitting powerful flames towards the ground to ensure a smooth touchdown. Construction workers already on standby quickly approached the landed pod. They efficiently assembled the modular housing contained within, made from ultralight materials. The pod's shell served as the building's outer walls. In under 20 minutes, a two-story building stood complete. The mothership continued this process, deploying buildings at a rate of one every 10 minutes. These included residences, solar and wind power generation facilities, and water purification systems. Tang Xiao, overseeing the operation, selected farmers and maintenance workers from among the 600,000 residents in cryogenic hibernation to awaken and descend to Dawn Planet aboard a transport ship. As the settlement began to take shape, Tang Xiao couldn't help but feel a sense of heaviness. Gazing out at the vast universe through a porthole, he was reminded of the mysterious dream that might have led to his current predicament. A surge of frustration welled up inside him. Clenching his fists, he struck the thick porthole glass, shouting defiantly against the fate that had brought him here, expressing a fierce desire to return home. After another punch, the bandage on his hand burst open, bleeding anew. Yet, his eyes burned with determination. The room fell silent once more. Calmly, Tang Xiao requested a nurse to tend to his wound and asked for the information he needed to continue his work. Resigned to his situation, yet not entirely without hope, Tang Xiao began to accept that returning home might be impossible. He realized that succumbing to despair would only jeopardize the future of those depending on him. The responsibility of leadership weighed heavily on him, understanding that the complex web of human society and the loyalty of his subordinates were at stake. Returning to his command seat on the bridge, Tang Xiao delved into the colonization plan, determined to understand the challenges ahead and how to address them. His approach was methodical and serious, focusing solely on the practical aspects of their mission rather than indulging in fantasies about the technology or the might of their spacecraft. His resolve was clear, to do what must be done, with diligence and care, for the sake of all who depended on him. Understanding how to establish a colony is paramount, particularly when faced with an unknown environment. Rapid development and the creation of a stable power base are essential strategies. This is especially true in the current situation, where trust is scarce and individuals are isolated by their own concerns. As a traveler, Tang Xiao is acutely aware of his solitude in this foreign land. Moreover, the lingering question of whether this environment is another Truman world adds to his unease. Pushing aside his confusion and anxiety, Tang Xiao selects an entry titled Guide to the Construction of Interstellar Colonies from his database. He opens the file, eager to find the knowledge that might secure his future in this uncertain world. Chapter 5. Star Wars. It's hammered. Tang Xiao had been deeply engrossed in the documents before him, which, combined with the knowledge previously instilled in his mind, began to assimilate into his own understanding. However, he knew that merely reading documents was insufficient. The true test was in applying the acquired knowledge. Master, I plan to inspect the Dawn Planet. Please make the necessary arrangements, Tang Xiao requested, turning off the screen in front of him. Understood, manager. Additionally, it is advisable to take your personal bodyguard with you for safety, the master advised. I have a personal bodyguard? Summon him, Tang Xiao said, intrigued by the notion. The door to the bridge opened, 
and a robust figure entered. Dressed in a military uniform, his physique was the epitome of strength, an inverted triangle, and his face, as stern as steel, was strikingly familiar. Upon seeing the bodyguard, Tang Xiao stood up in disbelief, his mouth agape. This? You? Could it be? From today onwards, I will serve as your personal bodyguard. You may address me as T850, the figure announced, standing rigidly, his posture impeccable. You're the Terminator? Tang Xiao exclaimed, taken aback. The military uniform seemed out of character for the figure he recognized as Schwarzenegger. I am a T-850 combat robot. The term Terminator is not recognized in my database. Please clarify. T-850 responded, his stance unwavering. Manager, I require clarification, the master interjected. The T-850 is a robotic bodyguard assigned to you. It is programmed with various protection and combat protocols suitable for different scenarios, ensuring it can fulfill its duties flawlessly, the master explained. But where did this robot originate from? Tang Xiao inquired further. Source information is unavailable. The T-850 was stored in the mothership's warehouse, designated as a bodyguard for you and other key individuals. Additional T-850 units can be produced by the mothership's factory if necessary, the master clarified. Acknowledging the familiar face he had seen countless times on screen, Tang Xiao nodded. Arm yourself and accompany me. Upon their arrival, the transport ship descended onto the leveled apron of Dawn Planet. Tang Xiao and T-850 disembarked, and workers, equipped with mechanized exoskeletons, immediately began unloading materials from the ship. These exoskeletons, primarily designed for engineering tasks, were fitted with various tools capable of handling extensive workloads, including lifting up to 500 kilograms. The colony's construction was visibly progressing, with over a dozen two-story buildings erected and additional facilities underway. Tang Xiao noticed several residents had already set up open-air hydroponic systems by a lake, initiating crop cultivation. As Tang Xiao made his way through the colony, every resident greeted him with respect and warmth. Hello, manager. I'm Gulaham, specializing in management. Following your recent appointment, I've been named the head of this colony. A young man with brown hair approached Tang Xiao, shaking his hand enthusiastically. I regret not meeting you sooner due to my immediate deployment, but your personal inspection is truly appreciated. Tang Xiao offered encouragement. I'll keep a close eye on the colony's development. Feel free to report any issues directly to me. It's an honor. Your decision to bring me aboard the mothership and entrust me with this responsibility is something I deeply value. Gulaham expressed his gratitude, quickly regaining composure. By the way, manager, during our construction, we encountered some local protists, which appear to be intelligent life forms. How should we proceed? Indigenous life? Tang Xiao raised an eyebrow in concern. Over there, Gulaham pointed towards the forest's edge, where shadowy figures could be seen moving. Tang Xiao lifted the binoculars to his eyes, scanning the surroundings. He spotted several figures resembling upright bears about one meter tall, draped in anim, all skins, and wielding stone spears. They pointed curiously at the newcomers, some cheering at the passing transport ships in the sky, and a few even knelt in reverence. A chill ran down Tang Xiao's spine as his initial smile faded. A fan of the Star Wars series, he immediately recognized these beings. The Ewok people. It's really the Ewok people, he whispered to himself. The planet's familiarity now made sense. Unlike typical planets orbiting stars, this one orbited a gas giant, a unique characteristic. He realized that before he dubbed it Dawn Planet, its official name was Endor, a name renowned in the Star Wars universe. Endor was the epicenter of the climactic battle between the Galactic Empire and the Resistance in Star Wars Episode VI, Return of the Jedi. This revelation confirmed they were indeed in the Star Wars universe, prompting Tang Xiao to worry about potential encounters with Star Destroyers. Despite the cushion mothership's size, it was merely a civilian vessel, ill-equipped for combat. Pondering the current era, Tang Xiao noted the absence of war debris around Endor, suggesting the conflict that would topple the Galactic Empire hadn't started yet. This universe was rife with turmoil, marked by numerous wars, the fall of the Galactic Republic, and the rise and division of the Galactic Empire. He turned to Gulaham, 
instructing, inform the mothership to include candy and some heavy machine guns in the next transport. The natives seem non-aggressive. Approach with caution, use candy to foster friendship, but also prepare defenses and construct towers. Understood, manager. I'll see to it immediately, Gulaham responded. Encouragingly, Tang Xiao patted Gulaham on the shoulder. Keep it up. Starting as a village chief is just the beginning. I look forward to seeing you rise to mayor and even governor. Gulaham's eyes sparkled with determination. Saluting, he then energetically carried a large box to the wind power station under construction, forgoing the mechanized exoskeleton, and dove into the work with zeal. Tang Xiao sighed in relief, stepping forward to take in the view of the lush, untouched world before him. The serene landscape, from the babbling streams to the mirror-like lakes, the birds soaring through the sky, the herds of beasts racing across the plains with predators in pursuit, and the distant towering trees and mountain silhouettes was breathtaking. Dark clouds gathering hinted at an impending light rain, adding to the scene's vibrancy. If not for the alien flora and fauna, Tong Xiao could almost imagine himself on the African savanna in spring. This vibrant world lifted the heaviness in his heart, and he took a deep breath, savoring the moment. Suddenly, an anxious voice broke through his reverie. Manager! Manager! Wake up! Startled, Tang Xiao realized he had unknowingly dozed off, standing no less. What? he began, only to be interrupted by the sound of more than a dozen boxes crashing to the ground from mid-air, their contents scattering. What happened? he asked, turning around quickly to assess the situation. Tang Xiao stood perplexed as the T-850, who had been by his side, provided a simple explanation. Just moments ago, the objects in your vicinity began to levitate as if by their own accord, yet your physical state appeared normal, akin to being in a deep slumber, the T-850 stated. You're telling me I managed to fall asleep while standing, and during that, objects around me started to float? Tang Xiao asked, turning to Graham for confirmation, who had been observing the scene with a mix of curiosity and fear. Yes, exactly. We were too apprehensive to approach. Your bodyguard monitored your vital signs and assured us they were stable, so we kept our distance, Graham admitted, his voice still tinged with unease. Tang Xiao was taken aback, his mind racing with possibilities. Could it be a case of oxygen intoxication? Or something else? He pondered aloud. The thought of what might have caused such a bizarre occurrence worried him, but he knew specu, Lation wouldn't provide the answers he needed. Resolute, he decided. No matter. I'll return to the mothership on the next transport ship. I want a comprehensive medical examination. As he was making arrangements for his departure, an unexpected interruption came through his communicator. Mr. Manager, I apologize for the intrusion, but an urgent matter has arisen that demands your immediate attention. The mothership has just intercepted a hyperspace communication originating from the planet Dawn, announced the voice of the master through the device. The sudden message added another layer of complexity to Tang Xiao's situation. With the mysterious incident of unexplained levitation and now an urgent communication from Dawn, he found himself at the center of unfolding events that promised to challenge his understanding of the world around him. Chapter 6 The Uninvited Guest The revelation of hyperspace communication was a startling discovery for Tang Xiao, indicating the presence of intelligent life forms capable of interstellar travel. Without hesitation, he ordered, Master, pinpoint the origin of the transmission immediately, alert all fighters, and secure the area at once. Gulahan Mu, you're in command on the ground. Acknowledging the command, a transport ship carrying a landing team ascended swiftly heading towards the coordinates provided by the mainframe. Manager, you seem unwell. Perhaps you should return to the mothership, a female crew member expressed with concern. I'm fine, Tang Xiao replied with a stern expression. Turning to his companion, he commanded, Let's go, T-850. We need to apprehend the individual who sent that signal. Upon their arrival at a desolate hill, they found the transport ship already on the ground. A hidden cave entrance was guarded by over a dozen marines, intermittently firing into the cave. The marines, armed with outdated 21-type assault rifles, seemed almost anachronistic in the advanced interstellar era. What's the situation? Tang Xiao inquired. We've identified three individuals inside the cave, 
they're evasive and unresponsive to our attempts at communication. Capturing them alive under these conditions is challenging, a Marine reported. Proceed with caution. We need them alive, Tang Xiao instructed, glancing at the formidable T-850. Without a word, T-850 grabbed a metal box from the transport ship, throwing it to the ground with a loud thud before pushing it forward as a shield. The cave's occupants responded with a barrage of energy beams, which harmlessly deflected off the box. Following T-850's lead, Tang Xiao entered the cave, which appeared to be a makeshift stronghold filled with various supplies and communication equipment. Three men, dressed like explorers and acting like desperados, were firing from behind cover, their curses filling the air. Suddenly, T-850 stood, absorbing several energy beams without flinching. Then, with astonishing strength, he hurled the metal box, causing a chaotic explosion of debris. The three men immediately surrendered, their previous bravado evaporating. Take them to the mothership for interrogation and language analysis. Also, inventory this stronghold for any useful items, Tang Xiao ordered, rubbing his forehead. As the militants were subdued, Tang Xiao's attention was drawn to a discarded blaster pistol. With a simple gesture, the pistol levitated and flew into his hand, a display of telekinetic ability that left the captives visibly terrified. Escorting the prisoners out, they encountered a group of Ewok natives. Tang Xiao queried the captives, Ewok? Despite the language barrier, the name of the species was universally recognizable. The prisoners nodded eagerly, hoping to avoid further confrontation. This chapter not only advances the plot, but also deepens the mystery surrounding Tang Xiao's abilities and the nature of the uninvited guests. The action is vividly described, enhancing the reader's immersion in this interstellar adventure. Tang Xiao nodded slowly. He pointed to the ground beneath his feet and inquired, Endor? The three individuals nodded in agreement, and one of them, catching on to what Tang Xiao was asking, pointed to himself and announced, Corellia! He then traced an arc in the air, adding, Tatooine! Finally, he drew another arc, pointed to the ground, and concluded, Endor. It appeared they had journeyed from the planet Corellia, passed through Tatooine, and ultimately arrived at Endor. Tang Xiao mused internally that Endor should now be renamed Dawn, as it was under his control. However, there was no time to admire the scenery. He needed to return to the mothership. Having captured a few individuals in the Star Wars universe, it was time to imprison them and have the mastermind decipher their language. Taking his place in the captain's chair on the bridge, Tang Xiao pondered his next steps. He realized he needed SI, stance, and decided to review the list of individuals eligible for awakening. Upon accessing the elite-level characters, he discovered several elite biologists among them. These biologists required a habitable planet with a complete ecological system for research and a basic laboratory with living conditions superior to those of the workers. Tang Xiao decided to awaken these biologists, instructing them to first report to the medical room for a physical examination, then to the bridge for a briefing on their duties, and finally to transport the necessary experimental equipment to Dawn Planet. Their task was to analyze the biological chain structure on Dawn Planet to determine which crops could be cultivated by humans and, if necessary, identify suitable local crops. They would also investigate whether livestock, such as pigs, cattle, and sheep, could thrive there and whether local organisms could serve as a food source. With numerous tasks at hand, Tang Xiao awakened an expert in management and colony construction to assist him. Soon after, a woman in her thirties entered the bridge and saluted Tang Xiao. Hello, manager. I'm Daphne Clement. I've been appointed to assist you with the colony's construction. Please allow me some time to familiarize myself with the current progress, and I will promptly begin drafting further plans. Daphne Clement had extensive experience in refugee resettlement and post-disaster reconstruction, having successfully led numerous projects in disaster-stricken areas. Her expertise was invaluable, and her awakening conditions were modest, requiring only sufficient material supply and manpower. Interstellar colonization was a challenging endeavor, and much of the necessary experience could only be gleaned through similar work. Thank you for your efforts. Please begin your work, Tang Xiao responded warmly. I will grant you the authority to awaken ordinary residents. 
you do not need my approval for awakening fewer than 100 people. You will serve as our first chief executive. Understood, Clement replied, her chest swelling with pride. She requested permission to awaken some members of her personal team to aid in their efforts. Tang Xiao reassured her, As I mentioned, you don't need my approval for awakening fewer than a hundred people. Additionally, the five civilian staff members who previously worked here will now report to you. You will lead the administrative department. With Daphne Clement set to work, Tang Xiao settled back into his chair and requested the main brain to open an editable interface for further planning. Tang Xiao meticulously drew a vertical line on the paper before him, carefully annotating it with several words from top to bottom. At the very top, he noted the opposition between the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire, followed by a lengthy period during which the Galactic Republic solely dominated the galaxy. Continuing downward, he marked the division within the Galactic Republic, leading to its opposition against the Confederation of Independent Systems, which he labeled as the First Galactic Civil War. Further down, both the Galactic Republic and the Confederation of Independent Systems were crossed out, signifying their unification under the banner of the Galactic Empire, which then dominated the galaxy. At the bottom of the timeline, he noted another split within the Galactic Empire, leading to a confrontation with the Rebels, which he identified as the Second Galactic Civil War. Additionally, he drew a circle labeled Endor, indicating the current planet of Dawn, and marked it with a cross to denote one of the main battlefields. This timeline represented the main plot of the Star Wars universe. Next to it, Tang Xiao drew a large question mark, pondering the current era. The absence of war near the planet of Dawn suggested that they were situated before the onset of the Second Galactic Civil War. However, this still spanned a considerable period of time. Taking a deep breath, Tang Xiao gazed at the timeline with a sense of gravity. Now in which era are we exe? Satili, he wondered. Note 1. The type of blasting beam mentioned here refers to the weapon seen in the Star Wars movies, often criticized as slow lasers. In reality, these are not lasers but rather a form of plasmized explosive gas. This will be elaborated on in further detail later. Note 2. Similar to The Mechanic of Infinite Legends, this narrative will gradually introduce readers to the Star Wars universe and its plot. Even those unfamiliar with the series will come to understand and appreciate it through this book. Chapter 7. Gaze from the Head of the Milky Way In the vast expanse of the Milky Way, the Galactic Republic has stood as a colossus, ruling over thousands of galaxies for more than 25,000 years. Governed by the combined authority of the Galactic Council and the Jedi Order, the Republic has maintained peace and order throughout its territories. The year is 35 BBY, during the era of the Republic, marked as 25118 in the Galactic Calendar. Coruscant, the gleaming capital of the Galactic Republic, shines as the pinnacle of development and prosperity within the galaxy. Among its architectural marvels, the Jedi Temple stands out, with its five towering spires rising above the massive trapezoidal base, a testament to the supreme guardianship of the Jedi Order over the Republic. Within one of these majestic towers, an elderly man in his seventies, his gray beard a contrast to his vigorous spirit, delivered a report with a stern tone. Master Yoda, Senator Palpatine has pledged his support in the Senate. He will advocate for the judicial fleet to dispatch forces to break the siege of Neil. Master Yoda, the venerable leader of the Jedi Order, stood by the window, his diminutive green form silhouetted against the sprawling cityscape of Coruscant. Despite not turning to face the speaker, he acknowledged the report with a nod. Thankful, we are, for Senator Palpatine's assistance, he said, his speech pattern marked by an unusual inversion that lent an air of peculiarity to his words. Master Dooku, the one who had delivered the report, responded with a slight nod his demeanor remaining cool. As he approached the door to leave, he paused, casting a sideways glance back. If the liberation of a planet from pirates requires personal favors to pass legislation, what does that say about the future of the Galactic Republic? And what of the Jedi Order's role in this? He questioned, his tone icy. Master Yoda, still facing the window, replied after a moment, Call me master, you should. The rebuke caused Dooku's cheeks to twitch in annoyance before he briskly exited, 
the door slamming behind him. After a while, Yoda sighed deeply, his gaze turning thoughtful as he contemplated the horizon. Outside, Master Dooku, struggling to contain his anger, hastened along the corridor. He encountered a pair of individuals dressed in simple robes, a middle-aged man with unkempt hair and a young, energetic apprentice with a buzz cut. The older man stepped aside promptly, bowing deeply. Master, he greeted with respect. Despite his irritation, Dooku acknowledged the greeting with a nod before continuing on his way out of the temple. The middle-aged man, maintaining his bow until Dooku was out of sight, then led his apprentice into the room Yoda occupied. Master Yoda, you wish to see me? He inquired, bowing deeply once inside. I have sensed a disturbance in the force, Yoda revealed. The man, taken aback, immediately grew concerned. Is it the dark side? No, not the dark side. It is chaos I sense, Yoda clarified, his eyes closed as he attuned himself to the force. A chaos? Where and why? The man asked, his brow furrowed in confusion. That I cannot say, Yoda admitted, shaking his head. The disturbance grows stronger. You must see it for yourself. Go to the model sector, Master Qui-Gon Jinn. What am I to look for? Qui-Gon inquired, seeking clarity. I do not know. May the Force be with you, Yoda concluded, his tone solemn. May the Force be with you, Qui-Gon echoed, bowing once more. He then turned to his young apprentice, Obi-Wan, and said, Let's go, Obi-Wan. Kenobi, proceed to the model sector, instructed the elder. Yes, Master, the young man responded with a nod. After the exchange, Master Dooku retreated to his quarters, activating his communicator. A holographic projection flickered to life, revealing a man in his forties, adorned in a senatorial robe, his hairline receding. Dooku offered a slight nod, acknowledging the figure before him. I'm deeply grateful for your assistance this time, Senator Palpatine. Without your intervention, the inhabitants of Neil would have faced devastating losses at the hands of the Biscaran pirates. Senator Palpatine returned the gesture with a smile. It's my duty, Master Dooku. In these trying times, it's rare to find a Jedi who challenges conventions and champions justice as you do. Dooku, however, expressed his reservations. That's not the outcome I desired. This situation shouldn't have been resolved in such a manner. The reality we face is complex, and the efforts of one or two individuals won't bring about change. We should be thankful for the resolution we achieved. More pressing issues, like the recent conflict between Malastar and the Corporate Alliance, are beyond our reach, Palpatine reasoned. Dooku found himself in agreement. You're right, Senator. These problems are too vast for just a few of us to handle. We need to rally more allies. Palpatine nodded, relieved. That's precisely my point. Yet I remain hopeful that if we stay true to our principles, the chance for change will eventually arise. I wish that day would come sooner rather than later, Dooku replied, his voice tinged with a hint of frost. It will, in due time, Palpatine assured him, his tone laden with implication. By the way, I've heard there might be some disturbances in the model sector. Dooku raised an eyebrow. The model sector? It's a desolate region in the outer western territories, riddled with hyperspace anomalies and dominated by a massive black hole. It's beyond the Republic's jurisdiction. What sort of problems could arise there? It's nothing major, just a matter of concern. If you could arrange for someone to investigate, I'd be grateful, Palpatine mentioned casually. I was considering sending a few Jedi apprentices. No, I'll dispatch some bounty hunters from my home planet of Sereno instead, Dooku decided, quickly abandoning the idea of involving the Jedi Order. Your efforts are appreciated, Master Dooku, Palpatine said, his smile carrying a deeper meaning as he bowed slightly and terminated the communication. Why do you want Dooku to investigate the force disturbance recently detected in the model sector? A deep, shadowy voice inquired from behind Palpatine. It's akin to training a cyborg war dog. Frequent commands will gradually accustom it to obedience. Ultimately, it's about control, Palpatine explained with a sly grin. Is that your only motive? The voice probed further. Of course, my lord. Palpatine replied, bowing slightly, his expression carefully concealed. Good. Then, the situation on Malastar could use a bit more chaos. Stir the pot further, the dark voice commanded. As you wish, my lord, Palpatine responded, maintaining his flawless smile as he exited the office, walking backward into the shadows. Note, 
The Star Wars universe uses the Battle of Yavin for, from the first Star Wars movie, A New Hope, as its chronological anchor. BBY stands for Before the Battle of Yavin, marking years before the event, while ABY denotes years after the Battle of Yavin. The Galactic Republic, established in 25,053 BBY, lasted until its fall in 19 BBY. The year 35 BBY, therefore, corresponds to 25,018 years after the Republic's founding, setting the stage for the events of this narrative. For newcomers, think of BBY as analogous to BC before Christ, and ABY as AD Anno Domini, simplifying the timeline. Chapter 8. I Need Help We are merchants from Corellia, seeking furs and rare metals. Please, let us return home. The words were translated haltingly by a cylindrical robot. Beside the robot, three captured militants lay on the table, groaning weakly and occasionally managing to utter a word. Tang Xiao sat across from them in the interrogation room, legs crossed, observing the trio's act with a detached interest. Behind him stood T-850, expressionless, maintaining a perfect soldier's posture, with feet shoulder-width apart and hands clasped behind his back. A full Earth Standard Day had elapsed. In these twenty-four hours, under the relentless interrogation of the Marines and the strategic questioning by their leader, the three militants had been coerced into revealing an exhaustive amount of information. It seemed they had recounted everything from their birth to the present day, including the cries of their infancy. Now, the analysis of the Galactic Standard Language had surpassed 40%, enabling basic communication. However, deciphering the intricacies of its syntax and grammar would require more time. Unaware of the grim future awaiting them, the militants continued to feign misery, hoping to appeal to Tang Xiao's seemingly kind and youthful demeanor for mercy. Tang Xiao, however, was unmoved by their act. He turned to the translation robot and inquired, Where is the capital of the Galactic Empire? The question confused the militants, and one corrected him, The Galactic Republic, not the Empire. The capital is Coruscant. And who leads the Jedi Order? Tang Xiao probed further. The militants exchanged bewildered glances and shook their heads, indicating their ignorance. Indeed, during the Republic era, the Jedi Knights maintained a low profile, their existence more myth than reality to the galaxy's ordinary citizens. Pondering for a moment, Tang Xiao shifted his line of questioning. Who is the speaker of the Galactic Council? After a brief pause, one militant replied, Finis Valorum. Tang Xiao's expression shifted subtly as he asked one final question. Has there ever been a war on the planet Naboo? The militants shook their heads in unison. Without another word, Tang Xiao stood and left the interrogation room, heading towards the bridge. The manager has left. Let's proceed. Describe the appearance of this cat with utmost accuracy. The mastermind's voice instructed as marines, imposing with their broad shoulders, entered the room, casting cold glares at the militants. Soon, the interrogation room echoed with their miserable cries. Back on the bridge, Tang Xiao settled into the captain's chair, leaning back as he gazed at the command center's ceiling, lost in thought. He had narrowed down the current Star Wars era to a span of less than 30 years, but this realization was far from comforting. The galaxy was on the cusp of an unprecedented, devastating conflict that would engulf nearly every corner of space. In this upcoming turmoil, the Galactic Republic, with its history spanning over 25,000 years, would meet its end. Tang Xiao began to piece together the Star Wars narrative from his memory. The current Speaker of the Republic's Parliament was Finis Valorum, and the conflict on Naboo had yet to erupt. This was a crucial juncture. The Battle of Naboo would lead to Valorum's resignation, paving the way for Palpatine to become the new Speaker. Under Palpatine's manipulation, the Republic would find itself divided and at war a decade later. The Outer Rim planets, long exploited, would declare the formation of the Confederation of Independent Systems, setting the stage for a three-year galactic war against the Republic. In the midst of the Clone Wars, a conflict teeming with legions of clone soldiers, Schiff Palpatine, perhaps the most formidable schemer the Star Wars universe had ever encountered, masterminded the entire ordeal. His machinations were designed to undermine the Galactic Republic, annihilate the Jedi Order, and quell the resistance in the Outer Rim. Following this, he ascended to power amidst the hell, ruins of the Galactic Republic, transforming it into the Galactic Empire. 
Reflecting on this, Tang Xiao couldn't help but sigh, feeling overwhelmed by the enormity of the era he found himself in. He lamented, Why must it be this darkest of times? I stand no chance against Palpatine. In matters of politics, conspiracy, personal strength or power, I am vastly outmatched. How am I expected to survive? The thought of surrendering crossed his mind. Should I submit to him, join the Galactic Empire and serve at the Emperor's pleasure? Tang Xiao pondered this path seriously, but soon dismissed it with another sigh, realizing that would be impossible. He would surely seize the mothership, and all the invaluable data within its database would fall into his hands. Frustrated, Tang Xiao stood up abruptly, shouting at the ceiling, Ah, it's so infuriating! Daphne Clement and Chi Jian rushed over in concern, but Tang Xiao simply shook his head, signaling them to return to their duties. Watching their retreating figures, he muttered to himself, I need assistance, a politician capable of standing up to Palpatine. Yes, a politician. He understood that in the Star Wars universe, at least for the moment, the Galactic Council held ultimate authority. This realization led him to conclude that brute strength alone was insufficient. No matter how formidable one's personal power might be, it couldn't rival the might of the Death Star or a Star Destroyer. However, a skilled statesman could command countless Star Destroyers with just a few persuasive words. Observing Clement and Qi Jian, Tang Xiao realized they were not suited for the political arena. Clement's expertise lay elsewhere, and Qi Jian, though a competent staff officer, lacked the necessary prowess for such a monumental task. He also noted the age and experience disparity among the classes, with younger individuals in the ordinary class and older, more seasoned individuals in the master class. This hierarchy suggested that with enough time and experience, anyone could ascend to higher levels of mastery. However, cultivating talent was only part of the equation. To even consider challenging Palpatine, Tang Xiao recognized he first needed to establish a presence on the galactic stage. For this, he required the aid of a politician of at least master-level caliber. Taking a deep breath, Tang Xiao began to sift through the list of individuals eligible for awakening. To his surprise, the list had undergone a change. Previously categorized into ordinary, elite, and master levels, with three question marks indicating an unknown category, one of these question marks had now been revealed to represent legendary characters. Mastermind, when did you unlock the legendary character? Tang Xiao inquired, astonished. After your awakening, manager, legendary characters and those of higher tiers will not pledge loyalty without significant abilities on your part. Attempting to awaken them without the requisite capabilities could lead to turmoil. At this level, every individual possesses formidable abilities, perhaps even surpassing yours. Note 1. This background information references the main plot of the Star Wars prequel trilogy and the animated series, The Clone Wars. Chapter 9. I Want a Spaceship. Tang Xiao feverishly scanned the list of legendary characters, only to discover that the majority were inaccessible. However, a few names were visible. Why can I see the names of these individuals? Does this mean they can be awakened, he inquired. The system responded, Direct awakening is not possible. According to the pact, they made before entering hibernation on the mothership, they will pledge allegiance to you. However, the loyalty of individuals of such caliber is difficult to guarantee. Therefore, you must negotiate with them in a semi-conscious state. If they find your offer appealing, they will agree to awaken and serve you. So, the names I can see are those of individuals who might be persuaded under the right conditions? Tang Xiao pondered, feeling a mix of excitement and trepidation. These names belong to characters from films, television, and games, each with countless tales and legends to their names. He marveled at the realization of what legendary characters truly entailed and wondered about the even more formidable individuals represented by the last two question marks. Correct. Additionally, if negotiations fail, they prefer eternal slumber over servitude. However, if their demands are fully met, they can be awakened directly without the need for negotiation. Be warned, their demands are often steep. The main brain elaborated. Tang Xiao nodded, his eyes suddenly catching a name that sparked an idea. If he were to confront Palpatine, this individual could be invaluable. Despite lacking loyalty, faith, and justice, and being driven solely by power, 
self-interest, and ambition, such a person could indeed rival Palpatine. Tang Xiao hesitated, aware of the risks, but his resolve was firm. His singular focus was on preparing for the impending war, which was still decades away. Everything else was secondary. Closing the legendary figure's page, Tang Xiao felt a chill. Interacting with such formidable individuals was a far cry from the control he felt in games or movies. He realized he was significantly outmatched. Are you awake? Tang Xiao mused, leaning back and attempting to use the force to move a cup of tea towards him. His joy was short-lived as the cup crashed to the floor, shattering. Perhaps I should start by awakening a few cleaners, he mused, observing the spilled tea leaves and the bustling bridge crew. This mysterious power, known as the Force in the Star Wars universe, is a supernatural and omnipresent energy capable of incredible feats. Users of the light side, known as Jedi Knights, and those who embrace the dark side, known as Sith Lords, wield this power. The epic conflict between the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire epitomized the struggle between the light and dark sides of the Force. In the aftermath of a decisive victory, the forces of light triumphed, and the Sith Lord was vanquished, relegated to the shadows. Amidst this backdrop, Tang Xiao discovered his affinity with the Force, amusing himself by levitating fragments of a shattered teacup, guiding them smoothly towards a trash can, though they scattered around its vicinity. Manager, Qi Jian approached Tang Xiao, who was reveling in his newfound power. Observing the levitating teacup pieces, he offered his sincere congratulations. Congratulations, manager, on mastering this mysterious and formidable power. What do you need? Tang Xiao inquired, his attention momentarily diverted. Qi Jian responded, Our staff department has just finalized a plan concerning our military capabilities. Please, have a look. He then transmitted a data packet to the screen before Tang Xiao. Tang Xiao perused the plan and the accompanying data, then said, Summarize the conclusion for me. Qi Jian nodded. The priority for us now is to enhance the mothership's defense capabilities. Relying solely on the blade fighter is insufficient. It's essentially a sealed metal box with a cannon and an engine attached. Therefore, we need a more potent starfighter. Fortunately, the mothership's production line can directly manufacture this new fighter, which saves us the time and resources needed to construct a space dock. Tang Xiao gestured for him to continue. We propose initiating the research and development of the Blade II fighter immediately. We want the research department to analyze this fighter's technology as soon as possible and adapt the production line for its production. Additionally, we should begin research on infrared laser weapons to upgrade the Blade II fighter's weapon system, Qi Jian explained, presenting the data for a fighter. Tang Xiao recognized the fighter as the one from Homeland 2, an upgraded version of the current Blade fighter. Its design was sleeker, with improved maneuverability, but its firepower was still lacking, equipped only with a six-barrel electromagnetic cannon. Qi Jian's suggestion to research infrared laser weapons made sense, considering it represented the advent of basic laser weaponry in the stars and was a practical choice. However, Tang Xiao shook his head after reviewing the data. He was acutely aware of the formidable adversaries they were about to confront. From his understanding of the Star Wars universe, the Galactic Republic's mainstay was the ARC-170 heavy fighter. Against such a powerhouse, both the Blade and Blade II fighters were no match, merely flies to be swatted away. After some thought, he declared, I will immediately establish a physics research department to start working on infrared laser weapons. And what of the Blade II fighter? Qi Jian inquired, hopeful. The Blade II offers only a marginal improvement in our combat capabilities. For now, we should increase the production of Blade fighters to a hundred units and await the integration of infrared laser weapons. That's our current objective, Tang Xiao stated. Qi Jian, concerned, countered, but the Blade Fighter's reliability and combat effectiveness are questionable. In a conflict, we risk losing many pilots in vain. Is the Blade II any better? We need a fighter that's significantly more powerful, ideally one that can operate in the atmosphere. The enemy we're about to face is far more formidable than we've anticipated. Tang Xiao interrupted him with a dismissive wave. You must understand, we don't have the luxury of time and resources to invest in developing and producing interim solutions. 
In truth, Tang Xiao had already decided on the next model of fighter to develop, the CF A-17 Ghost Fighter from StarCraft. In this book, characters and technologies that are overly dramatic or excessively fantastical, such as Gundams, will not be featured. Chapter 10, The Invention Project. Research projects are the lifeblood of innovation, and the CFA-17 Ghost Fighter stands as the pinnacle of the Terran Empire's military might in the StarCraft universe. Tang Xiao, upon closer examination, realized that the current model of the CFA-17 Ghost Fighter available for research and manufacturing was merely an early version. It lacked the advanced pulse laser designed for ground attacks. Despite this, the Ghost Fighter's capability to operate both in atmospheric and space environments made it an exceptional asset, as demonstrated in the StarCraft narrative during conflicts with the Protoss and Zerg. Future iterations of this fighter would include a stealth system, transforming it into a formidable stealth fighter. The challenge, however, lay in bridging the technological and production gaps between the homeland and StarCraft universes. Tang Xiao was determined to overcome these obstacles, confident in the ability to assimilate and apply the Terran Empire's technology within the human-centric system of homeland. Qi Jian, after expressing his concerns, respected Tang Xiao's decision and prepared to follow his orders. Tang Xiao then reached out to Daphne Clement to inquire about the availability of a modular building for the Engineering Research Institute within the mothership's warehouse. Clement confirmed the presence of a modular scientific research space station on the mothership, designed to accommodate around 20 experts for extensive experiments and research. Without hesitation, Tang Xiao ordered the immediate construction of the Engineering Research Space Station. He then accessed the Mothership's Character Awakening database to identify suitable candidates for the project. Among the elite, he awakened three engineering specialists, two women and one man, all in their 30s to 40s. They introduced themselves as Guan Yan, an energy expert, Dr. Feng Yongwang, a mechanics expert, and Dr. Qi Shuiwen, a material science expert. Tang Xiao tasked them with simultaneously researching infrared laser weapons and the CFA-17 Ghost Fighter. Guan Yan suggested the need for a physics laboratory and at least 20 physics majors for the laser weapon project. Dr. Har Feng Yongwang, after reviewing the Ghost Fighter's data, noted the technological disparities but remained optimistic about overcoming them with initial help from five mechanical engineering majors, expecting to request more resources as the project progressed. When asked about timelines, Dr. Guan Yan estimated that the infrared laser weapon research could be completed within a month. Dr. Feng Yongwang was more cautious about the Ghost Fighter project, suggesting it might take a year to fully analyze and adapt the technology for production, especially without guidance from a master class expert. Tang Xiao assured them of full support in terms of personnel and materials, expressing gratitude for their efforts and encouraging them to commence their work. Tang Xiao nodded in agreement. Indeed, manager, you're steering the ship, and our job is simply to perform well. We should be the ones expressing gratitude to you, he said. Ku Shuiwen returned the sentiment with a smile. I'll compile a list of what we need, announced Guan Yan. Regardless of the location, he knew all too well that scientific research demanded an immense amount of time, effort, and resources. As the list of supplies continued to grow on the screen, Tang Xiao maintained a polite smile, though internally, he felt a pang of distress. The colony had just begun to see improvements, accumulating some material reserves, and now, it seemed all of it was being allocated to the scientific research team. In the outer ring of the Milky Way, within the western region of the model sector, a disc-shaped Corellia YT-1000 light spacecraft was about to exit hyperspace. We're nearing the end of our hyperspace jump. Time to wake up, dear, said a human woman who was maneuvering the spacecraft to the pilot beside her. The pilot, a man in his thirties, stirred from his doze. I'm really starting to miss the sparkling wine back on Corellia. After we complete this delivery, I'm heading home for a well-deserved rest. I'm thinking at least three days worth, he mused. The Corellian galaxy isn't kind to folks at the bottom like us, Quinto. I prefer our current life, free and unbound the woman replied, leaning over to kiss her lover's forehead affectionately. 
Suddenly, a commotion erupted from the rear cabin, followed by a loud thud. Someone had evidently kicked a malfunctioning machine. Then, a Rodian emerged. Resembling an upright seahorse with bulging, lidless eyes and straw-like mouthparts, Rodians were known as a hunting species. Despite joining the Galactic Republic and entering the Interstellar Age, many still pursued careers as bounty hunters. What's the problem, Spade? Quinto inquired. It's nothing too serious, just potentially fatal. Falasi, you should notice the seventh indicator light on your left flashing erratically, right? The Rodian replied, clearly frustrated. Falasi glanced back and gasped in alarm. My God, the hyperspace diverter isn't responding. How is this happening? She frantically attempted to correct the issue via the console, to no avail. Well, all we can do now is hope we don't get torn apart exiting hyperspace, Spade said resignedly, sitting down to brace for the worst. Hyperspace diverters ensure we're not shredded by physical phenomena upon exit. Without it, initiating a jump is impossible. So, unless we're incredibly lucky, if something goes awry during the jump. Quinto left his sentence hanging as the spaceship exited hyperspace. To an outside observer, the vessel would seem to materialize in space almost instantaneously. After enduring a violent shudder, they managed to stabilize the spacecraft. Quinto gazed at the colossal structure that loomed before them and whispered in awe, That's man-made. Spirit of Karaya. What in the world is that? Falasi exclaimed, her voice laced with shock. The radar revealed a gigantic, moon-shaped spacecraft cruising in the planet's synchronous orbit. The vessel was so vast that from their YT-1000 lightship's porthole, all they could see was an endless expanse of metal. 